Gents, I just want to pause the episode for a moment to let you know about the Strong Men of Value Academy. You will have heard me refer to it a number of times and I want to bring more attention to it. So this isn't just a program. It's a life-changing environment and community of men who are focused on personal and professional growth. We're looking at areas of relationships, wealth and health, things to help you thrive and maximize your life. Imagine having bi-monthly one-on-one coaching sessions with myself, weekly group coaching calls, and an incredible brotherhood of high achievers by your side. Now we're diving into resilience, leadership, and holistic growth to not just succeed in your career, but to thrive in your health and your relationships. Your journey to greatness, it starts here. So join the movement and you can apply for the Strong Men of Value Academy. You can head to the manthatcanproject.com to find out more. Rory, welcome back, mate. Episode two. Well, second time around. It's so good yeah. to have you back on the show. Thank you for having me on once again. I hope that the I hope that we you know we find some new material. I, I don't want to sound repetitive. No, well, I think it's an important message, but I have listened to our podcast. I've also listened to another a uh, couple of other ones that you've been on, just trying to look for new things that are happening. And you know, a lot's happened since we've spoken in twenty twenty one. Like it's crazy to think that feels like yesterday because I continue to share this episode with a lot of mates in my life. It's whenever people have a problem with alcohol or it's always the work meeting's fault that why they got drunk. I'm like so sick of hearing those excuses. Listen to this episode and it's just fired me up to get you back on the show. <laughs> amazing. Good. Thank you for having me back on. And, and, you know, it's been amazing to get some of this exposure and just how fast this message is growing. Um, and there is now a very long list. I mean, my part, my, my, Half time of my role now is podcast guesting and and interviews and journalist interviews and things like that. It's it's uh, really going some uh, some some speed, which is super exciting. Just to put that into perspective, so where this really came from was uh, the Huberman Lab did a podcast on um, it's called um, the Truth About Alcohol, and it's now the most watched and most shared, and that's the number one podcast in the world. Right, so this is the this is the top episode of the top podcast in the world, um, and I think that was a huge shock to um, Andrew Huberman. Um, by the way, if you don't know that podcast, it's um, Professor Andrew Huberman is the professor of, gosh, he says so many words when he describes it, but it's neuroscience and, and and ophthalmology and pophthalmology um, <laughs> at Stanford University. I can't do all those things. Um, but he he debunks neuroscience and science, and it's it's an amazing podcast. So, uh, Rich Roll, I then had been reaching out to for a while, which is a pretty big podcast. I think it's thirteenth largest in the world on Spotify, uh, four hundred million downloads. And um, I was like, you know, the 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 message we're putting out to the world is all wrong. I can tell you why uh, we can reach a much wider audience if we change the conversation. And when I got and sat down with Rich, he said. Did you know that the Huberman Lab is now the most watched and everything else? And this is why we've brought you on at the peak time of year for our podcast. So they put me on week two, which is when they're every single year, their listens are at their absolute peak. So they wanted wow. to put me in in the front seat. Yeah. Just to let you know that that podcast has been shared nearly 200,000 times just on one single platform. It's hitting over 8 million views now, and it's more watched than any of his other celebrity guests in the last two years. Schwarzenegger, Stephen Bartlett, all of those things. So it ha- it's gone properly viral. And what does that mean? What is that saying? Well, finally, after nine years, I- I've been podcasting for nine years, after nine years of bedewing the world with this message, it's now starting to listen. People are rethinking you know? their relationship with alcohol. This conversation of, hey, I think alcohol is holding you back. Is there a part of you that thinks that alcohol is holding you back? Because Did you know? that's the truth. And finally, that message is resonating with people. Did you know? Did Such you know? a powerful episode. And as I said, I've been sharing it with a lot of, like the episode that we've done and a lot of your resources with people. Did you know? A lot of people, when they think about alcohol, it's like all or nothing. So their instant thought is, I need to cut it out or I can just carry on with my life. And that's not essentially the big issue, right? Like the big issue is more so changing our relationship with it, understanding how we can moderate um, our alcohol use and find moments to do that. And I know for you, um, for a bit of the backstory, for those who haven't listened to the previous episodes, you got to a point in your career where 
work meetings and the binge drinking stuff was ruining your marriage and almost ruined your life completely. Did you know? A lot of men are in that position. They're, you know, marriages are on the brink of divorce, but they lean into alcohol. They lean into it as a coping mechanism. Why do you feel you were different and you decided to change your relationship with alcohol? Did you yeah. know? Thank you. I want to just did poke you know at what you just said there a smidge. Okay. It's all very well sitting here today saying, oh, I nearly lost my marriage and I nearly had these issues happen to me. But that wasn't the truth in the moment. Okay. I just had a very tumultuous marriage. And I'm sure many of us have those. When we started dating, my parents and friends around us gave, oh my good Lord, we give you guys days max, right? Because it was such a tumultuous, you know, marriage. It was such a tumultuous relationship. Jen had very severe childhood trauma, very, very different, difficult childhood. And so this whole brewery has problems with his relationship was not new to anyone, right? And my wife was like, the problem is you're drinking. And I was like, well, this is really simple. It's part of my job. Do you want the Jimmy Choose? Or, you know, that was basically my attitude, right? Do you want the nice house? Do you want the car? Do you want those things? Because this is part of the job. And in my world, that was just normal. It was perfectly normal. Perfectly normal that wives would be very unhappy with their men. Perfectly normal that their wives would give the men lots of grief when you go home. Perfectly normal that there would be fights about you coming home at one o'clock in the morning. Perfectly normal that you might fall asleep in the disabled toilet, which I did multiple times, <laughs> instead of coming home just because there's only an hour and a half left before I have to get back on the desk, right? In fact, so did normalized, you know? when I got married, the guys said, good man, get the first one in early. Did okay? you know? So what we're talking about is, did you know? how do you identify back in that moment that you're nearly at rock bottom? Because rock bottom is only discovered when you actually achieve that thing. And in traditional AA, this is part of the process. They say, go away until you've finally had enough. Did uh, you they'll know? say that on phone calls as a part of AA. Uh, when, you've, when you've literally, excuse my language, fucked your life up enough, that you're willing to submit yourself to God, admit you're powerless, and then keep returning to a place every single week for the rest of your life, which Did is the way know? that system operates. So in that moment, Did you know? in, if, I, if I don't have a wife who's saying, that's it, I'm out the door. Now, Did my wife you know? might say that to me quite often. Uh, and one day there was a text message, which was like, fuck you, I'll be in Sweden with our daughter. And I thought to my mind, great, that means I can go and get pie-faced for a week. And I did. Got pie-faced, hung out with my pals. Some of my friends were like, you should really go and get her. Go on. So, you know, after a week of having lots of fun, I went over and made amends and apologized and all of those things and got her back. Did but you know this very, very tumultuous relationship. That's what it was. So I think in did the, you know the conversation, and the reason why I bring this up, not defending it, but just painting it clearly. Did you because know? Because when we, when we talk about, oh, did you know? here's a guy who fucked his life up and then he stopped drinking. 99% of people who drink switch off. They did go, you know? that's not me. I haven't fucked my life up yet. I'm fine. I'll carry on, right? And, and so they're sleepwalking till that moment happens. How many of us actually did you have know? issues in our relationship predominantly caused by alcohol? How many of us have our worst arguments with our partners after drinking? How many of us recognize that actually alcohol is making us feel a little bit more anxious, a little bit more depressed, and not quite as productive as we are at work? And that's causing financial woes, and therefore creating more arguments in our relationship. How many of us are quietly waiting until the doctor says, Did you know? If you have another drink, you're dead. Did you know? Right? Now, why wait for that? right? Let's not wait for it. So in this whole area of prevention, where we actually want to say, well, hang on a minute, I do realize that this thing is causing me a bit more trouble than I realized. I'd like to reduce it. We have to get clear on our psychological pain. We have to get clear on the truth. We have to actually go, hang on a minute, this is causing issues in my relationship. Hang on, this is, you know, causing me to be less productive and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to give a shot at changing my relationship with it. And if things start to improve, Hey, presto, I found one of the issues, right? I found one of the issues. And I think that's what's really, really important in the communication now. If you want to reach um, Lachlan for you, 
right? You're, you're on a wonderful journey of changing your relationship with alcohol. If you want your journey to inspire the most amount of people, don't talk about rock bottom. Don't Did you know? talk about like everything blew up and then you were forced to change. Just talk about it in a way that reaches the vast majority of the audience. You know what? I was feeling a bit anxious and I felt like I just wasn't being the best version of myself. I knew I had more to give. I knew I wanted to achieve more in my life. And I knew that if, if, if anything was holding me back, it was alcohol and it was definitely worth testing. So that's why I'm changing my relationship with it. And now you're talking to everyone who drinks. Nobody can go away in the corner and go, oh, that's not me. Makes sense. Did you know? You were literally you know? speaking to me just then, for those who don't, I haven't, I guess I'm not publicly talking about Did you know? not drinking for the year. It's just a personal goal that I've set for myself. And I don't have a bad relationship with alcohol. I rarely drink anyway, but there's always been this thought in the back of my mind. What am I capable of if I just completely cut it out for 12 months and allow myself to get up early on Sunday and not have those hangovers, even though there might be four hangovers a year. But my, even my wife's already said, you're not as moody. Like if I'll have a whiskey, we're, you know, we're in Tennessee now, so we're in urban country. Um, I will say that before we started the podcast and you were having some technical issues, I was detecting some moodiness in there. <laughs> but I, I did have to swing back a shot of whiskey to get through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's such a, a key point and that's, I'm glad you brought that up because I did want to talk about that. Now, a lot of the data that you guys have collected and even, you know, I know for you, you got a text message before, even though it's not alcohol related, but it's because you're getting um, crook, but it's cool that you've made the effort, but you're, there's all these data points and I use a whoop, you're using an aura and you guys also track with, what was the other device that you said? Aura and yeah. So there's ways that you can track that, but some of the data that you've got is like 79% better sleep, 92% feel better, 71% more productive. 81% feel less anxious and 53% lose weight. Like when I was reading that, like if I'll have I was like, even just one of those would be good for most people. I know yeah. that when I'm less anxious, I absolutely like have crush it at work. I'm a much yeah. better husband. I'm a much better bloke. Like if I'll have I, when I sleep better, same thing, my performance for work and, and training and all of that goes up and it's like, I'll have done, why am I not sleeping well? Or why am I such a prick to my wife and our relationships falling apart? I've like all, have, I know alcohol is a reason for that. And I personally, one of the reasons why I do tend to have a drink if I go to a social function is because of social anxiety. I just feel mm -hmm. uncomfortable. But to the point that you mentioned before, it's like, why am I feeling uncomfortable here? What can I do to become comfortable in social situations rather than just always needing the bottle? Yeah, like if I'll have, exactly. if I'll have So, um, well, we, we, we covered a lot of ground there. And I think that the way to... The way to communicate to people, because if you look at our relationship with alcohol, we are totally brainwashed and indoctrinated by society, by huge amounts of marketing every year, that all this social conditioning over decades has built up these neural pathways. Since we were in nappies, we have been watching, right? Some of us were drinking then, if you're especially West Coast <laughs> Scotland, I think use, it, use it to rub it into your teeth. Um, so, so, um, but, um, you know, we've been watching people celebrate, commiserate, congratulate with alcohol. And, you know, the brain puts on, it, it re, you know, puts on constantly these things that we repeatedly do and see. So it's building those neural pathways around this stuff. So all of these cre creations are indoctrinated in our head. And so like if I'll have what, that, what that means is that we are, we are abjectly refusing to believe that the thing that we think that is the source of fun happiness, love, good times, success, which we have spent decades building up the belief that it is, right? You can go into your teens and, and then when you first start having a drink, it's about inclusion. If I want to be included, I need to, I need to have a drink and I need to drink well. And then you get into your later into teens and, and 20s and it's about getting laid, right? And then what about finding a partner? And then, you know, connecting with that partner happens when you're partying and having fun. And then it becomes about having fun and then it becomes about having success, right? You're like, oh, wow, if I take people out for dinner and if I do these things and I drink well and I'm a hard drinker, and if you enter it into sport, right, it's about decompression and bonding and building. So again, all of this indoctrination happens over time. So what happens is, is this quiet questioning comes in, you know, hey, you know, 
I think alcohol is causing you more trouble than you realized. And you immediately hush it. No, 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 don't be silly. Don't be silly. Shh. No, no, no. That's, no, 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 no. Don't say that. This is, is, imagine like you've, you've got this trusted friend who is a loyal, trusted friend, your best pal. All the fun, all the happiness goes on with this best pal. Everywhere you go, it's just fun and happiness. And then somebody says to you, you know, he, he's, he's cheating on you. He's, 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 you know, messing around behind your back. You're like, no, no, no. He would not do that. I don't believe that. And that is where most people are with our I all have with alcohol in the beginning. We're in absolute denial that this thing is, is causing us proper this trust have built up over time. And as we start to question that more and the more podcasts put out, the more things we listen to, the more science that's going out there, the more that questioning builds. You're like, hang on, I'm building up a bit of a campaign about my best friend here. I'm not sure you're too good for me anymore. Um, and I think that's, that's time when you you get into a moment where you say, do you know what? I think maybe we should have a break for a little bit. Let's just part ways just for a little bit. And I want to see if life gets better. Suddenly you find that all of your life improves. Your wife stops hating you. And you realize that this best friend has been whispering in your wife's ear about what a cunt you are. And now suddenly she's like, oh, none of that was true. Right. And, and so he's been running around behind your back doing all these sabotage things. And you're like, you bastard. I can't believe you were doing that. I actually have actually wrote a letter, which again, went off like wildfire. Is this the brand someone when you're a kid? The dear or? alcohol letter, um, which is a letter about, hey, you know, you have been my best friend. You got me laid. You got me fired. You, you helped me find my, my partner. We've had so many times. There was one comment. Um, you, you had me in a little town called something or other when I should have been at the altar. Um, you know, all of those kind of stories, but now I've realized the truth. I've realized the truth of the impact, um, what you have, and it's time for us to part ways for a bit. Sorry, I went kind of divulged on that, but you were specifically asking about the level of, of data. Um, and I think that data is a very compelling tool for behavior change. Um, and just like a book, right? A book can be a very compelling tool for behavior change. And I think maybe in our lives, if you read voraciously, you will take a small segment of each book and implement it. Maybe 1%, maybe 5%. If it's a really, really, really good book, 10% at best, right? I don't know how many thousands of books you've read, Lachlan. I have literally tons. I mean, I read voraciously. Right. Same. If I implemented 100% of those books, I'd be a billionaire many times over. I'd have six pack abs. I mean, just everything. I'd probably be already calling You'd have it all. Yep. You'd be an exactly. Adonis. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> Zeus. So, so information is just one thing. And same as data. Data is just one thing. I think it's a very compelling tool. You're using Whoop, you're seeing your sleep. What you brought into conversation there is where we are taking data to a much, much, much higher level. So, in our complete control program, we use the Aura Ring. Uh, we also use the First Beat. They're used for two different things. Um, but I brought it up this morning because one of our doctors who works with our health team and monitor our participants 24-7, and predominantly we use it for accountability. We're also there to monitor their health and make sure they stay it. But to understand things like sleep deprivation is a significant driver for compulsive behavior. I'm sure we'll come on to that later. But this is the message from my doctor today because I'm also being monitored. Hi, Ruri. How are you doing today? I wanted to reach out as I noticed. Elevated temperature deviation, possibly fever. Slightly increased resting heart rate, 64 BPM, baseline 68. Declined HRV equals 26 MS, baseline 35 MS. Declining trend for two days. Low deep sleep, 7.95%. Interrupted sleep, wake, repeated waking up in the middle of sleep. Just sounds like an entrepreneur's journey, doesn't it? No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, I suspect early signs of infection. Can't say specific causes based on the data I have, though. Is everything all right? Any symptoms? Uh, just last night, <laughs> I said to my wife, I don't feel great. And last week, my daughter had a chest infection. Um, so obviously, I have now picked that up. I love how it goes sequentially through the house. But what is compelling about that, right? So our team have early identified a stroke and called an ambulance in advance of that stroke happening. We have detected early onset COVID, early onset of flu-like symptoms, just warned people about their health deviation because we're monitoring these metrics every day. Again, that's the health side of thing. 
what should we help people stay accountable to? But on the flip side of that, the accountability side, that's what we all need. We all need our ass kicked every day. Imagine somebody's watching you 24-7. That If you don't exercise for two days, we are phoning you to kick your ass. If you don't meditate for two days, you're going to get a phone call from my accountability team, right? We are ruthless in helping create I think these all habits. Have it. So that's kind of taking data, but to a whole nother level. I think, all I think it's so important because, you know, and I know I was reading an article the other day and they say the Whoop data may be 75% accurate or something, but it's not, it's about what it then gets you to start thinking about what has put me in this position. It could be illness, as you've said, but for a lot of um, our members, they're high performing men. They do probably what you did a number of years ago, or the, even the entrepreneur's journey where we burn the candle at both ends. So it's then looking at what are my restorative protocols? How can I get my heart rate variability back up? Or even breathing, right? People are like all ventilating have, just walking around because our breathing is so bad. Like all have, alcohol, whenever I drink alcohol, like, like all have, you see this huge spike on the whoop where it goes from like 39 beats while I'm sleeping to about 55. I I'm like, all that's have, not good for me. <laughs> so let's, yeah, let's exactly. moderate that. One thing we haven't, I guess I would love to dive into in a bit more just is- Just before you dive into that, just before you dive into that, what you said exactly there is, so I read some research um, that was showing that HHC, which is a um, like all synthetic have version of THC, um, mm -hmm. and uh, HHC, THC obviously is a compound part of cannabis or a can part of cannabinoid. Um, and um, so and HHC has been helpful with sleep deprivation. So I thought, okay, well, this is interesting. I love testing out all of this stuff and everything else. So I, um, I took, uh, for those who are on YouTube, you'll be able to see this. So I tried it a couple of nights and I slept amazing. And I thought, wow, I've had the whole way through sleep. I didn't get up to wee. If you're over 40, you'll know what that's like now. Um, and um, I thought, this is true. I've had, I've had really good sleep. Then I put on the first deep beat device. Um, and it's the world's most accurate heart rate variability monitor. You actually wear a couple of electrodes. Again, it's it's not really the device that you do on your own. You do it with a practitioner. And that's why we have a team of people. We send it out to people. We're helping people understand the data. Because again, just seeing a chart doesn't really make any difference. You're not going to create any change. But somebody really helping you see the minutia of the data is what will help make compelling change. So red is sympathetic nervous system. See that where it says vape there? Yep. I had a vape almost instantly. Look at that massive spike of fight wow. and flight. Now, now, on top of that, look at the whole evening. Not a single minute of recovery. No green. I mean, okay, there's a couple of tiny little lines of green. So I do not enter recovery during sleep at all. I could all have what, is, what is that? Hey, Riri, slow down. What does that mean? This is your central nervous system. And it is a core part of our compulsion, our desire to numb out. It is the main part of source. There's lots of things that happen with our central nervous system. Like if all have we have parasympathetic and we have sympathetic nervous system. Our parasympathetic is, think of it like parachuting down. We're going into recovery. Our, our organs are regenerating. Our brain is regenerating. We're going into neuroplasticity. We are, uh, neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to learn and develop. And we need it at night. That's when most of our recovery happens. And in fact, now they believe that the vast majority of neuroplasticity happens during deep sleep, which is why deep sleep needs to be prioritized. When It doesn't matter whether you think you got eight hours last night. Oh, I had a drink and I got eight hours. No, no, no. Alcohol is horrific to sleep. So, and again, showing this people in the data. So what, what it really means is, and again, what we teach people is that it's not just important to have recovery at night. Recovery at night is critical. Okay, if you don't get recovery at night, you're heading for serious mental illness and ill health. All sorts of things are going to come out of this, right? Cancers, dementias, autoimmune diseases and disorders are the, are the result of sleep deprivation. Okay, and we're just starting to understand the, the importance of good sleep and uh, really putting that as number one on our agenda, protecting it with all of your might. Um, there was an interesting piece of research that said that we produce cancer beating cells predominantly at night when we sleep. And it's from that deep and uh, that element of recovery. And again, if you drink alcohol, you're putting yourself into fight or flight with cortisol, not producing those cells. So come back on track, Ruri. God bless me with the ADHD. <laughs> No, it's, it's very, very, so, um, 
Interesting. When, when it comes to the parasympathetic, this is calming our nervous system there. And the most important thing we are, we are teaching people is that we must find recovery during the day. Okay. Uh, think of it like this. Stress um, as, as an element of compulsion is one of the core drivers of compulsion. Okay. If alcohol is a significant factor on you or drinking or, uh, you know, vaping or uh, binge watching Netflix or work addiction, which I'm sure most entrepreneurs have hand up. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, exactly. So this is all about stress. Um, yeah. Ex to, yeah ex to describe how important stress is, we had uh, Dr. Rajita Sinha, um, work with us and come on the podcast, spent the last 35 years studying addiction at Yale University. She's the head of addiction research at Yale University. Two years ago, she turned around to the, uh, the board and she said, I want to change the name of the department. And they were like, what? Why? She said, I want to change it from Yale University study for addiction to Yale University study for stress because addiction is just the outcome. Okay. Now, if she has spent 150 peer-reviewed studies. She's an amazing person. If she believes that it's all centered in that stress thing, then this whole parasympathetic sympathetic, this is absolutely key. It's a core part. And I want to give you an analogy for a second, because this is really easy to understand after me using lots of words and lots of complexity, which even I don't understand half the time. I'm kidding. Um, is... <laughs> Think of it, think of it like, a, you know, those little toy plastic cars that have got a little plastic dynamo in them. You push them yep. along and they go further than you push. Yeah. Okay. So that's your central nervous system. Now, if you are neurodivergent, so ADD, ADHD, bipolar, OCD, if you're on the neurodivergent scale, you have an even more geared dynamo. Okay. So that means that the more you push it, the further it goes. Now, imagine you wake up in the day and let's say you drank alcohol last night, which has significantly diminished your sleep and both alcohol increasing cortisol production turns you into fight or flight all night and sleep deprivation is very, very detrimental to our central nervous system. So now your ability to deal with stress is significantly diminished in the day because of those two factors. So you're already a wound up car. And then you start winding it up from the day, drinking coffee, some foods you eat are significantly impactful on your central nervous system, like junk food, crap like that, releases inflammation. Then you've got stress from work, stress, 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 there's no break. Then you get to the end of the day and you put this little toy car that you've been putting down, expecting it to relax and for you to go to sleep. And it goes, fuck you, and it shoots <laughs> off into the distance. True. All right. Exactly. And that's your brain. I can't switch off this brain. It's just absolutely running at 10 million miles an hour. What's wrong with me? I'm going to have a drink because it's amazing. And guess what? Alcohol is amazing at yeah, switching it... off that brain. So we think it is good at that tool, but actually it makes that whole cycle beget itself. Once again, it creates that issue in the morning and therefore you need it again, right? Alcohol begets itself. Yeah. It... So effectively what we teach people is when it comes to stress, you can actual, actually handle a much higher level of stress than you realize. And more importantly, here's an important point. If you've been regularly consuming alcohol now for a few years, right, decades, you've been increasing the production of cortisol, right, which means that you have been slowly reducing your ability to deal with stress. So it may feel like you're more stressed out now, right, but actually you've reduced how much stress you can deal with before you go into overloaded central nervous system. Um, and so really what we teach people is when you're winding up that car, when it gets to the top, just pause, pause yeah, for a minute. Let yeah, the energy come out of that little dynamo and then wind it up again and then pause and yeah, then wind it up again. And in the data, this is you going from, from fight or flight back to parasympathetic where you're in recovery. And during that, during that, during the day, means that when you get to the end of the day, when you put the car down, it rolls nice and gently to a stop and you can fall asleep. And then you don't need an alcohol, which and blah, 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 blah. That whole system doesn't run. Yeah, it's right. so I thought, but exactly. It, I guess some outcomes of that as well. Yeah, it's coming into my head is you're not going to snap at your children or your wife. Yeah, it, maybe instead of Yes. Yeah, it, can that be? Yeah, we're less, not miracle still, workers. Yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> still happens. It's still a little shit sometimes. And so oh, are the yeah. kids. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a good quote where it's like, there's yeah, a good it, quote where it's like, drink never made man better, but it made him think he was better. And that's yeah. when I, when I heard that, I was like, 
I definitely feel like that liquid courage is an important part. You touched on, we'll go back to like not completely removing alcohol from our life shortly, but there was something that you touched on with the core drivers. You yeah, mentioned it, core drivers for compulsion. You gave us the example of stress being one. What are some other of the core drivers there that people can be aware of? Excuse me, that's my chest infection uh, that my doctor warned me of that I was getting this morning. <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad you didn't cancel. She's, she's based in Ethiopia, which is, that. how cool is that? And, that is um, amazing. So, yeah, um, core drivers. Look, let's, let's talk about the principle. Um, I never wanted to tell anyone ever that I was powerless to anything because that's not true. And I would never admit that that, that was true. Um, I did go to a couple of AA meetings. I was recommended to by a counselor. Um, and they said, just go and see what it's like. And I went in and thought, this is not, this is not me. It's, it's not where I am. This is, I'm not like that. Um, and then there was nothing really else. Just one second. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There was nothing else really out there that I felt I resonated with. And so um, in this whole journey, launched One Year No Beer, helped lots of people take a break from alcohol, saw the same thing again and again. People could do a break. They could do six months. They could do a year like I did. But then they would go back uh, within a few weeks or months to like problematic drinking. And I'm like, no, we need to help people in a more significant way. And that's what kind of sent me on a, on a journey over the last eight years, really. Um, working with some of the top scientists out in the world, studying what was going on out there in terms of compulsion, addiction, trauma, the latest research in habit change and behavior change. Um, and we know, we know what drives compulsive behavior. We've known for decades. Yeah. It, so why, yeah, it, we, why aren't we helping people with that? Why? why? I don't yeah, understand it, why we're not starting there. Why yeah, are we starting it, with you're powerless and yeah, you have it, a disease <laughs> and, or here's some medication? Mm. There's something of a broken system there, methinks. Um, and by the way, remind me to come back to talk about that um, because I, w I will. Thank you. So, um, yeah, it, let's yeah, start it, with those those things that we know drive compulsion. Number one, the yeah, source it, of most of our desire to numb out, to switch off, is rooted in our past experiences, predominantly as a child. Um, and I know, especially talking to men, uh, half the room is now run away. <laughs> going, what yeah. the fuck? I don't want to go back there. I've spent my whole life fucking ignoring that stuff, packing it down. I'm strong. I don't need to go back into all that stuff. Well, I just want to explain how important this is. I actually think that we are going to have an entire healthcare revolution over the next decade. And I would like to be, maybe this is my ego speaking, probably, but I want to be one of the pioneers really flying the fag there, is that actually almost all of it is in, driven by this past experience trauma. Okay, when we look at some of that stuff and some of the research coming from Gabor Mate and, and the studies that are done out there, yeah, it, things like uh, autoimmune diseases and disorders, right? A huge amount of them are actually a direct result of unprocessed childhood trauma. Um, these past emotions, so let me just describe this. During zero to seven, we are not yet, our prefrontal cortex has not yet switched on. And this is the area just behind our forehead here. Um, and um, the prefrontal cortex is used for rational decision making. So when somebody shouts at you today, you go, oh, that's somebody who hasn't slept well, if you meditate. If you don't meditate, you probably punch the lights out. But anyway, um, so, so, and that's your prefrontal cortex rationalizing that you're safe, you're strong. That person's not going to attack you. This is all within reason, blah, 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 blah. Right? As a child, we don't have any of that. We don't understand. You watch what happens to a baby when a mother lose, lo goes out of the room at a very early age. That baby does not think that mother's coming back. Right. And that is a hugely impactful moment. Now, you look at that and you say, well, good God. I mean, uh, you know, l literally, he here's an example that somebody else was talking about recently. Uh, the daughter is putting on a tutu, comes new little pink tutu, super excited, runs through to dad, who's busy, and goes, dad, look, 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 look at my new tutu. And dad goes, oh, it looks good, but it looks a little bit small for you. Are you a bit, you know, all of a sudden that child has, you know, eating disorders for the rest of their life, right? And you're like, okay, well, hang on a minute. If that's the case, we've all given our kids childhood. Yep. Hands up. I, childhood, giving them trauma. Hands up. Yep. I have, you have, if you have kids, we all have. And that's because childhood is traumatic. 
full stop. Now, I'm not belittling serious trauma here, right? Because lots of people have very serious trauma and very serious things happen to them. But I want you to understand that we all have these experiences in the past that created emotions that we didn't know how to deal with in the time, and we chose to pack those down. And at the same time, we probably made some decisions about ourselves that form our ego. Yeah, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I should never be on my own. I can't trust men. I can't trust women. I can't trust anyone. Whatever those things are. And yeah, they stay with us our whole lives until we actually decide to let go of them. Yeah, and this is why we use things, tools by Besser van der Kolk, Peter Levine, which are the world leaders today in understanding trauma um, and helping people shift past them, which is predominantly dealing with the emotion, not the conscious conversation, which is often what happens when we go to, to traditional talk therapy, but actually just trying to tackle the emotion itself. Yeah, it's, it's also some of the most promising work that's happening with psychedelic therapy and why I'm a huge advocate and we'll be using psychedelic therapy on our programs um, when we can, um, is that I really believe we can have an entire health revolution by helping people shift past some of the bullshit that we have in our, in our past. Just two things to mention to this. If you look at that, right, people come to say, well, I want to change my relationship with alcohol. And I say, well, that's great. If we only achieve that, we've only achieved 1%. Because yeah, the it, truth is, when we start to tackle some of this stuff, we're going to help you prevent ill health. We're going to help you prevent poor mental health down, down the past. We're going to help you prevent things like dementia, Alzheimer's, cancers. Can I, can I say that you won't get those things? Of course I can. There's so many other factors that are throwing into it. But if we know we can do something, why don't we take that action? And yeah, this is my, my thing to people. I actually got a message today from somebody, a lady on LinkedIn, and she said, I listened to your ritual podcast. I never really thought I had trauma, but I reached out to a practitioner of somatic experience, and I've discovered there's some significant things, and I honestly think this is going to be life-changing for me. And I'm like, yes, this yeah, is the work could, we need to help people do. Yeah, you could Yeah, it, So I was just going to say just to that, I was very similar to you. Like I've always, uh, sorry, not to you, but to that trauma experience, I thought I was all good. Life is flying. But I ended up doing like a hypnosis experience just because I was like, I wonder what I can gain from it. And when I went through this five day uh, experience, there was so much trauma. I was like bawling and recognizing Amazing. stuff that I'd never thought of ever. Yeah. Like it explained when, once I became aware of it, it explained so many actions that I was making in my life. And I was like, oh my goodness, now I can fucking yeah, it, learn to accept that and uh, appreciate that experience, but shift the perspective on it. And now I've, you know, and that was maybe three, four years ago. Yeah. My life's completely changed from that. And there's still stuff I've got to work on, but exactly. I'd managed and men are really good at it. We just sort of push it down. Yeah. It, there's always going to be something that we can work on. And I 1000% agree with you with the space of trauma and, yeah, learning it, to experience and understand our emotions, it's going to be revolutionary. Like even Joe Dispenza, a lot of his his work is is fascinating. The studies that they've got coming out as well. Yeah, it, amazing work um, with Joe Dispenza, exactly. Um, and I think you know, here yeah, we it, go along the lines, right? Meditation, uh, breath work, hypnotherapy, somatic experiencing. Yeah, These are all linked together in a way of the body and the connection between the vagus nerve and, and, and utilizing that and releasing from, you know, Besser van der Kolk books, the body keeps the score. All of those things are aligned on that same thing. Um, you need to give me that person's details because um, we use hypnotherapy as a part of the program. Oh. We're always looking for more experts um, to join our team. And, um, you know, we we are recruiting some of the top coaches out there in the world today to join um, this program. We have one of the lead coaches from Tony Robbins. Uh, we have coaches who've trained one on one with these world class experts, Gabor Mate, Peter Levine. Um, so we are gathering an elite team uh, to, to support people. So if somebody's had a very significant impact on you in one of these uh, modalities that we use, definitely want to talk. Yeah, yeah well. I've made um, note of that. Good man. So um, trauma being number one in a, a significant part. And what, 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 what we're seeing is that actually these two kind of lead on to each other because number two is stress and we kind of touched base on that. Be an idiot. Yeah. That's not you, it's dog. Just <laughs> making another guest appearance oh. as well. 
Don't have a dog in your podcast room is basically the answer. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, he, the, the trauma element, right, this past is probably not showing up as emotion. We don't really walk around crying. Some of us do. At some points, you can have a release. You can get to really the, the wit's end. You can feel like you're overwhelmed. Depression comes in, things like that. Unable to cope. Alcohol really creates more of that feeling of unable to cope because it begets itself. Um, yeah. It's and um, and then, but this this, so this past experience doesn't really show up as emotion. It shows up as a very busy brain. Um, it shows up as very critical, very um, um, self-sabotaging brain, very loud self-critic. And so that's also impactful on our central nervous system. So again, that's debilitating our ability to deal with stress. So when you come in with that stuff, we have to do that work first. Um, and this is why this is something really important to work, to remember. No amount of conscious work, no amount of control, self-discipline, process, no amount of using tools, habit, surface stuff will ever beat a self-sabotaging subconscious. Yeah. It, and this is why we have to start with the work back there first. Okay. So otherwise we're just putting plasters on top of problems. So the next thing we talk about is stress and, and I've highlighted how important it is to understand that. And we use devices to help people understand their stress. In fact, you can see from the many, many trust pilot reviews and many, many feedback from people, they talk about being able to handle a much higher level of stress. And I say to people all the time, like, what impact would it have on your business, on your career, if you were able to handle a much higher level of stress calmly, right? That would be a game changer, right? That would just be so huge. And so that's what happens when you start building in stress resilience tools and you start seeing it in the data and knowing yourself, right? Knowing thy body. Hang on a minute. I'm, I'm supercharged here. I'm going into that hyperactive level where I know I can't come back down. Now's my time to take a little break. Um, interestingly, you know, in this whole addiction research part is it, it's very, very, very common, right? So trauma being one of the big things that creates neurodivergence, ADD, ADHD. That dysregulation in the central nervous system drives uh, this desire to numb out and avoid. And what we do is we get linked into work and we find a way to get extremely busy avoiding feeling. Uh, and guess what happens? If people are able to handle a high level of stress and they are really busy getting busy, they become super successful. So this is why the high achievers and the people that we are, are talking to in the majority of our programs, business owners and people, they all identify with, maybe I am a bit ADD, maybe I am ADHD, I have wondered if I'm bipolar, you know, things like that, because actually these things are all intrinsically linked. Sorry. Um, so just touching on some of the other core drivers, because I think it's important for people to kind of reflect on these. Um, the next real driver is um, like relationships. Our closest relationships to us are a significant driver of compulsion. If they're broken, you've been through a divorce or lost a loved one, right? We can't change that, but we can change the feelings. And it's working with those feelings that we have around it that will reduce compulsion. And, you know, if you're going through a divorce, right, and you're like, well, this is just going to be extremely tumultuous right now then maybe it's important for you to do the trauma work and calm down the stress in other areas so you're not going to be so reliant on compulsive behavior because not all of these things are going to be in balance all the time. Don't be ridiculous. We don't go and sort these things out and they're all in green and you can move on happily ever after, right? They're a constant work. They're a constant balance. But at least knowing exactly what they are is important. So connection to others and around us is really important. Many, many, many people go in search of stopping drinking and then they avoid their social circle. They cancel seeing their friends. They know they get too much peer pressure. They hide out at home. Well, guess what? That creates disconnection. And unless you're a sociopath, we cannot be disconnected. So guess what it does? It brings you back to the fold because the only way you know how to feel connected to your group of people who are your friends and all that stuff is to drink again. Um, and this is the importance of creating connection out with this getting around groups of people who you can have fun or be successful or release dopamine through sport or whatever it is who are not choosing to drink and that's building those connections out with. So various other 
areas, uh, emotional regulation, um, mental health, um, et cetera, that really are the core drivers. But ultimately, what we're saying are, these are all things that you can change. And when you do change these things, like first of all, get awareness of them. And we use data and technology to help you get awareness. And then once you start changing them, if not change them significantly, the vast majority of your drinking slash compulsion will evaporate because they are the drivers. And many, and many, it sounds, many. For, it sounds so simple when you're putting all of that into place. The hard part I would imagine for a lot of people is one, understanding they're not powerless. And when you realize that it can be quite confronting because many, what's, the, and many, and what's many. the next step for me? What if I don't like who I am or what if I don't want to accept those things about myself from my own personal experience going through and I guess dealing with tra trauma and some of the dumb shit I did when I was younger was having to accept those versions of myself and go, okay, that's where I was at. This and version many, of myself wouldn't have done that, but I can't change that. I can only move forward, which means once again, I need to be aware of all the stuff that I want to be in control of because we're in control of everything. There's some things maybe we don't need to focus on right now, but the um, the areas that you just mentioned there, like connection, um, stress, all of those things are such powerful things, but you don't necessarily change them overnight. I remember, and we probably spoke about this when I first, um, we first had a podcast, but when I got into business, I wanted to be a millionaire and many. I read a book and I was like, okay, I need to hang around millionaires. That's going to be my fast track, right? I'm going to be able to learn all their, their tips and tricks and language that they use. But millionaires at that point, or well, the ones that I wanted to hang around didn't want to hang around with me. So many, the perspective many, was I could say I'm not good enough and just stay there or I could go, who do I need to become? What do, what do I need to be in control of and how do I grow through that to become that version of myself? And ultimately that started for me with alcohol. So I can't be doing recreational drugs like I used to and I can't be binge drinking because that's just not going to allow me to become the man that I wanted to be. And mm. it was con confrontational because I had to recognize I was a bit of a pig back in the day, but that's, <laughs> you know, that's a, a foundational step to grow. And many, it is. you're only going to look back at the journey and be proud of that. And many, yeah. Amazing. And I think that's <clears throat> the, the behavior change comes from either having enough pain or enough pleasure. Um, and when, when you're working in prevention, so, you know, Oh, I think alcohol is causing me more trouble than I realized, uh, but it would be much easier for me to just carry on as it is because that's what everyone else is doing, mm -hmm. right? So it's actually really, really fucking hard to change your relationship with alcohol in society today. It's really hard. And so if we want to get clear on many the pain, this is about sitting down and writing down like, what is this costing me? You know, the truth. How often am I hungover? What percentage of me is showing up at work on Monday? What, if I'm truthful, like if 100% is me out there crushing it, smashing out of a park, you know, just all fully aligned, just like pow, 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 that guy or gal, then um, if that's 100%, what percentage of you is showing up on Monday? What about many, Tuesday? What about many, Wednesday? And what about at home? And many, you know, if I was to bring your kids onto the call or have a conversation with your kids and say, what impact is is his drinking, his dad's drinking, mum's drinking, having on you, many, your relationship with your parent? Right? What would they say? You, what about your, your partner? If we many, were to just get them quietly on their own and say, what impact is, is their drinking having on you or your relationship? What would they say? What's the worst thing about his, her drinking? You know, so as you start to get really clear, you start to draw a picture of truth, not the many, stuff that sat in, back in your subconscious. This is the truth. Now, many, here's the thing. What happens if you, if you don't do this? Well, many, I think the vast majority of us, many of us, sleepwalk to a problem. Um, we sleepwalk to something breaking. We're almost waiting for it quietly. We're waiting for, you know, to get caught drink driving or to have, you know, um, somebody say, and we don't need to wait for that. So inside here, um, uh, I remember when, I, when we published our book, um, the the wonderful lady, the owner of the publisher, Pam McMillan, you know, sat down with her and she said, you know, and many, she's in her 60s and she said, out of all of my friends, I'm the only one who put my foot down with my husband about his drinking. And out of all of my friends, I'm the only one whose husband isn't either dead or has a very significant issue 
or health problems because of alcohol. Um, and in and a many, way, I speak to an awful lot of men who say, oh, my wife is good as gold. You know, she doesn't really, she doesn't mind. She doesn't mind. And I'm like, okay, but she's an enabler then. And many, she is, she is helping you and make many, this problem worse. And really what you need is even more to get clear. Like, come on, don't you think you could be better? And, and in essence, on the other side of it, is that if, if you sit listening to this and go, ah, oh, yeah, I just, I, I really don't think, you know, uh, it's not for me, or I don't drink that much, or whatever it is. What I just say to people is, why many, not give it a shot? And many, know, it's not going to cost you very long to find out. Maybe 30 days, maybe 60 days of really going all in on changing your relationship with alcohol, you know, applying some of the things I've talked about here. Um, and if you don't feel better and your life doesn't start to feel better and things improve, well, I'd be absolutely gobsmacked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thrown away. As would I. But it will, exactly. And then I think you've got your answer. Uh, and and many... I feel this way about everything, by the way. If there's something you're regularly consuming that you feel that you need, and caffeine is up there, and it is sweets and sugar, and social media, and your phone, if there's something you feel you need, then why not just try, try a, bake with, a break with it? Because I think by having a break, you actually see that this best friend of yours is a many a toxic asshole. A many, a many. I couldn't agree more with that. A many, even if your life is good. When I first did a three-month stint off you know, a couple of years ago, I didn't realize how good I wasn't feeling. I, I didn't feel terrible. And many, the mental clarity and the energy and the focus was phenomenal. And, many, and so now the, the exact reason why I'm doing the 12 months now is I don't many, have an issue. My energy is awesome. Life's going well, but I'm just curious to see what it feels like. And every day I'm not having a drink, I'm starting to enjoy that more. And I'm noticing my, um, my, if I, <clears throat> And many, that's standing out is just remembering people's names, like is phenomenal. And, and my many, brother-in-law, because there's six of us who aren't drinking, my brother-in-law has dropped 10 kilos, his memory is through the roof. And this is literally since just before New Year's, right? So it's not that long a time just yet. So the benefits are through the roof. I just want to, I know I want to be mindful of time. Um, one last question. The change in the relationship with alcohol doesn't mean completely cutting it out. And oh, many, a lot of people go, I, I just, you know, want a Shiraz, you know, I want to drink at my wedding or all of these sorts of things. And I think and many, one thing that I heard you mention on the Rich Roll podcast as well was that it's like there is benefit in drinking, right? There's social interactions and stuff like that. You still drink personally. Obviously, I'd yeah. love to quickly get your overview on that. And many, yeah, 100%. Well, first of all, um, after decades of research and also myself, I did a year uh, alcohol-free. Now I drink as much as I want, whenever I want. I just usually choose not to drink. Um, yep. I've removed all the associations. I don't go for steak and have um, um, red wine. I used to always, but now I'm predominantly carnivore, so that would mean I'd be drinking wine <laughs> three meals a day. But anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, <just> breakfast. <laughs> well, I was wondering what you were drinking before. Water. <laughs> Big red juice. <laughs> I'm sipping away on red wine whilst on this podcast. Do as I say, not as I do. No. Um, so I think, you know, after decades of research, tens of thousands of people all over the world, uh, where we'd asked people, what would you like your relationship with alcohol to look like to the wide public out there? 6% want to stop drinking. And almost everything out there is about sobriety and stopping drinking and how amazing stopping drinking is. You're only talking to 6% of the market. It's not what people want. And because many, of that, because there isn't enough conversation about, hey, let's reduce, let's just cut back a little bit. Why not in 2024, just change your relationship with alcohol a little bit? Like what would look that for you? Because there's not enough of that conversation, people do nothing. And so they do nothing and things continue to get worse. So with everything, we're a preventative health company. I believe that prevention should always swim upstream and keep going upstream and keep going upstream. So we can help people earlier and more if we focus on control. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing with that is, so the conversation there is control. People come into our program complete control because they are looking for control. By the end of it, 93% of people choose to carry on alcohol-free after the program. Not forever, right? But they're saying, that's it, I'm, I'm done. Now, they wanted control. They came in for control. But when we help them see the truth, and this is really, really, really important, okay? The and truth many... is, first of all, we have to go to town on this self-sabotage layer driven by these past experiences that are running amok inside all of our head, okay? 
we have to go to town on trauma. The second thing is that really to help people understand and see in data and with clarity that actually everything Many. that they want, everything they want at their core of who they are as a human being. I'm talking about, hey, when people are standing around your grave zone, what are they saying about you? What's your impact? How did you show up, right? When you get super clear on who you believe you are as a human being, the impact that you want to have, and that what you see is that everything that you want, literally everything that you want, to be happy, to be healthy, to be successful, to have a good marriage, to be loved and adored by your children, to be successful, to have lots of wonderful friends, to, to leave a legacy, to have longevity, to have peak performance and optimal health later in life. Everything that you want is actually being taken away by alcohol. And that's the truth. And, many, and when you show people that, there's no coming back from that. They don't. Many, they, they, are, they will never be the same. Luke, a well-known e-commerce entrepreneur in the UK, came to our program and he said, you cannot unlearn the things you learn in complete control. And so I like to describe myself as a white, slightly prettier version of Morpheus from uh, The Matrix. <laughs> Matrix. And I'm standing in front of people with the two pills and I'm like, once you take this, there is no going back. Um, and instead of going to a horrible, dark, miserable world with robots, we actually go to a much nicer world. So a <laughs> slightly different comparison. Um, so, sorry, it, the, the, the element of control is really powerful. I want to give one more example here. Um, so I had an ex-pro NFL athlete come on the program. This guy, total legend. Um, he's built a large private equity business in the U.S., um, complete machine, 12 times Ironman champion. I mean, a monster. And uh, in the original conversation, he's like, you know, Ruri, <clears throat> I don't have that much of a problem with alcohol. Like I, I can do a year alcohol free, no bother. I've done it twice. That's not a problem for me. But when I do have a drink, it's like I've won the Super Bowl and I disappear for three days and I can't afford that. Like I've got a respectable business family. Like I just can't afford this. If you can help me tackle this, then um, I'd be gobsmacked. Now, he took quite a long time to sign up. There was lots of umming and ahhing, and he wanted to check everything over. You know, lots of people, early days in the program, there was a lot of skepticalness. Um, I'm going to read out the two things. Six months later, he sends me this program. Now, he always said that the biggest issue for him was when he got together with his brothers. Like, yep. you know, with his brothers and with his ex-NFL athletes, that's when it just went mad. So... Uh, Thanksgiving was a great example. I rented an entire boutique hotel for my extended family, 26 people. Lucky guy. Yeah, Being awesome. with my brothers is always a huge trigger, so I packed a few cases of athletic brewing to keep on ice. I went alcohol-free Wednesday, allowed myself to drink regular beer with my brothers Thursday, but shut it down at midnight before things got crazy. Then went back to alcohol-free Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I worked out every day and spent tons of quality time with my kids, mum, siblings, nieces, and nephews. It was a blast. I honestly think... Learning control is 10,000% more powerful than quitting altogether. Condemning yourself to a lifetime of abstinence is simply too daunting for most people. Allowing myself to have occasional cheat days has been a huge part of my success. That was six months after the program, a year after the program, and we're recording this on Tuesday, just after Super Bowl on Sunday. And he sends me this message with this image here. I'm just showing you up there. Yeah. That was on the Super Bowl. He says, day two in Vegas for the Super Bowl. What have you done to me? With five question marks. And there's a picture of a salad along with water and a Guinness Zero. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That is awesome. And this is the thing is that people don't want to stop drinking. And so we have to meet them where they are. Condemning Abstinence does not equal control. In fact abstinence on its own can often make your relationship with it worse. We've proven this many times. Just aversion theory. No, you can't have that. Here's an example. Lachlan, don't think of a pink elephant. Whoops. Right? So it's we, uh, that's, a, that's a very simple, not quite related example, but this is what happens in aversion, inversion therapy, trying to avoid something. So the solution is not abstinence on its own. But here's the thing. A period of abstinence gives you the tools that you need, right? Energy, clarity, productivity, authenticity, uh, all of the, the clarity and the desire that you need to do the work, condemning which will give you control. Condemning is the key of, of helping people in a more significant way. I think that the condemning flip around here is to say to people, condemning hey, you can 
have a take it or leave it relationship with alcohol, you can condemning you change some things in your life. And we can take you on that journey, right? I don't know how long that journey is for you. It depends on where you are on this sliding scale. At the end of the day, if you are currently a severe alcoholic, sorry, I use that word because a lot of other people do, but it's not a term used by the scientific community anymore. We should really be using severe alcohol use disorder. Um, you could be a very severe alcohol use disorder, be homeless, you know, in a significant childhood trauma. Okay, well, that, there's a long road and a lot of work that we're going to have to do in order for you to get there. But do I believe it's possible? With every fiber of my being. And to tell people that you're going to be powerless for the rest of your life because of a disease is a fucking lie. <laughs> so I don't mean to be over enthusiastic with that, but my version means that we can heal addiction. Condemning the other version means that we can't. And I don't want to believe in that reality. And also, condemning it's not the truth anywhere else in the world. So why would it be truthful with this? Condemning your, condemning your, condemning your. It's a great way to finish. I could not agree anymore with that. I think when people accept they can't change where they're at, it's just such a powerless position and you want to live in hope and you want to live in productivity to moving towards that version of yourself. So I love what you guys are doing. Where can people find out more? Condemning your, condemning your. All over the interwebs. Uh, one year <laughs> yeah. to be here. You will find us. Uh, you will find me, Ruri Fairbairns. If anyone else has that name, I'll be gobsmacked. I feel for them so already. So will I, actually. Um, <laughs> that just that has been traumatic. Do you know how many times I've had to spell that out on a phone call? Good Lord. How many hours of my life? So, um, our Fairbairns on things like Instagram, if you want to reach out to me, um, you can email me, Ruri at one year no beer .com. Um It's complicated spelling, so good luck with that. And um, But we're on oneyearnobeer.com on Facebook, Instagram, all the usual, LinkedIn, um, putting out plenty of free content. I'm heard from, from thousands of people all the time about how we've inspired them and helped them change their relationship with alcohol. You can find our podcast. So I bring some of the world uh, most experienced and most relevant scientists from Yale, Stanford, from um, UCL, various uh, wonderful institutions around addiction, trauma, behavior change, habit science onto our podcast to help people. There's tons of free resources. If you want to come in through a journey, which is going to help you significantly increase your, increase your business, increase productivity, help you get on top of relationships, improve many, many areas of your life in a short period of time because you just want to get this done, then come and check out our complete control program. It is revolutionary. Uh, and I'm super excited to get this out to the world more. And thank you, Lachlan, for helping me do that. Thank you for jumping on here. It's so inspiring to see how far the movements come since we spoke last as well. And I'm very you know, inspired to continue seeing it. And hopefully we'll touch base over the next couple of years and you'll be continuing to empower and change people's lives. Condemning Amazing. Your Thank you so much for helping. Condemning your con Thank you for listening to the Man That Can Project podcast. My name is Lockie Stewart and I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it helpful. If you did, please take a moment to rate and review the Man That Can Project on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our newest episodes. We'll see you again next time.